More than 60 episodes of this podcast, So-Called Normal, have focused on the experiences and insights of those living with, coping with, and managing their own mental health. And some have identified their challenges as mental illness, but many more have framed their mental health in the context of just the messiness of life. In this special four-part limited podcast series, you'll hear the remarkable story of Mark Hennick. We hear his own account of a suicide attempt at the age of 15. We hear the matter-of-fact story of his rescue. And we hear the personal story of an ordinary man who did the extraordinary. Here's your host, Mark Hennick. My life, as I know it now, really didn't begin until I tried to end it. It was a cold, wet Cape Breton Sunday night, March 2003. This is the end, I thought. I was determined that it would be my end. I was in a state of of focused, practiced determination. I had climbed over the railing of a bridge. I'd perched myself on an inch and a half of concrete on the wrong side in Sydney, Nova Scotia. I was fully prepared to launch myself out over the edge and to greet the ground below. I still, to this day, don't know how long I stood there. Time does funny things when you're distorted in your mind like this, but when I did let go, since there was practically nothing under my feet, I began to fall. I remember the ground coming toward me as I fell. And then I remember seeing the arm of a stranger. He was wearing a light brown jacket. As I looked down and saw the ground coming toward my face, I saw his arm wrap around my chest, and he pulled me backward against the railing so hard that it knocked the wind out of me, and my feet flew up off of the edge. I dangled there for what seemed like forever, and then he pulled me back. I didn't know it then, but Mike Ritchie was my savior that night. Sure, he pulled me off of the edge of a bridge. He saved my life in that moment but he actually ended up giving me my entire life from that moment. More than 15 years later, Mike and I finally sat down and recalled that night on the bridge. Here's our conversation. I just put my arm around the front of you and grabbed the back of your jacket, and when I had you in that position, the other uh, police officer ran over and we both... Mm. She helped me pull you back over the railing. Somebody had told me later, and I can't remember who, um, that either you or somebody, maybe it was that, this other police officer that, that I've never, I don't know who that was, mm-hmm. had said that I just was gone, had gone completely limp uh, when, I was, when, when you grabbed me. Was that the case? Was yep. I, After the fact, um, yeah, we were just kind of holding you, like holding you up um, uh, and... At that point, after we had you safely over on the other side, that's when paramedics rushed in Mm. and they kind of took over. So it was just a brief, you know, moment that we were physically holding you when we had you over on the other side. Um, I remember you weren't like trying to walk away or anything. We were just holding you. Well, I wasn't there to fight anybody. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah, for sure. So um, at that point, then uh, they had put you in the back of the ambulance. I remember you were sitting with the doors were open for a little bit. And they were talking to you and, as I said, emptying your pockets and things like that. Right. I don't um, remember any of that. Like, that's that's just gone. Which, which fascinates me because it's, you know, I remember in such hyper detail, I remember climbing the railing step by step. I remember uh, that the railing was wet when I put my, when I draped my hands over it. I remember it was cold and it was wet. Mm-hmm. Um I, you know, I remember seeing the little pebbles uh, under my feet fall, and that's how I was trying to judge the distance. I remember the fence. But I don't remember, like, from the moment you grab me, it's basically, that's when it goes offline. That's when I just drop back away again. Do you remember anything that night um, about being in the hospital, like, when they took you in? Nothing at all. Nothing at all? Nothing. And I had been there so many times that it's not like that any of that stuff was new for me. They mm-hmm. all knew me there. Mm-hmm. And actually much later, I recently learned, I don't know if I've told you this or not, as I look through all of my hospital records, 
on one of those later admissions, I don't, I don't think it was that one, I think it was the time before that one, in the discharge note, uh, the social worker wrote, we should probably leave Mark's file open because he's probably going to be back. <laughs> I'd become a frequent flyer. Oh, God. <laughs> they knew me by name by that point, right? So it's not like this was a, n- a new place for me, but still, I don't, they didn't keep me long, mm-hmm. I can tell you that. And, and actually, that, that I, I think as I became one of those kids who the more help they need, the less help they get, right? Because I was a high service user at that point. So I don't, I was the boy who cried wolf. I don't think I don't even think actually when I was discharged that time and I could be wrong about this but um I don't think anybody even came to pick me up. I think they sent me home in a taxi. Wow. <laughs> wow. But I do remember uh that I was discharged on the first day of spring. And for me that was important for some reason. Really? <laughs> Cuz it was the last time I tried to kill myself. Okay. I think it's spring, new start. Right? This, uh, this is like, and, and it took me many years to make that connection. And what I've kind of triangulated the difference this time, because I'd been di- admitted and discharged lots of times. This wasn't, this was part of a, a, a trajectory in many ways, I think. Um, and that's why I went to the bridge, because I felt like this is my, this is what's supposed to happen, right? This mm-hmm. is, this is causally, uh, deterministically how it's supposed to happen. But, when you get into these places in your mind, you ruminate a lot on on often unhelpful things. You focus on unhelpful things. For whatever reason, on the psych ward that time, uh, I started focusing on you uh, and on that stranger uh, on the sidelines at at the barricades. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the whole part of the whole reason that I was there was that I felt like I had no control over my life. That I was just destined to be this sick kid or criminal because that's what everybody always thinks about mentally ill people that they're criminal despite the fact that that's not true that's been researched over and over Mm -hmm. again right um and i didn't want to be that i felt like i had no control otherwise so i needed to to control whether or not i was alive or dead because i didn't want to be all these other things that i thought i was destined to be but i realized in the psych ward that time that i didn't have to be like that that i didn't have to be on the sidelines you know of my own life that I could be like you <laughs> I could be I could be a, a stranger uh, maybe not in a, you were wearing a light brown jacket at the time I, I say that to, to people all the time because that's all the only thing I remembered about you um, and I could be like that person who has people's back and who saves people's lives and who you know who is a superhero for these kids right that's I think what changed for me that time it's it's crazy to hear you say that in that way you know because I that was never um I had no idea that 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 moment in time would have such an impact on someone's life, like in, in terms of what you've done with your life since, as right. you just said, kind of like. Um, well, I will say it's not like it was my come to Jesus moment and everything was better. I'm suddenly sure there was a lot of better. other things along the way. It wasn't there like, was, you know. and this is what people don't understand about recovery too. That yeah, I stopped trying to kill myself more or less. It, it a doesn't mean I stopped thinking about it mm-hmm. um, because that's a whole other thing, uh, and it doesn't mean I stopped being depressed and anxious, and it doesn't yeah. mean I, I stopped having home difficulties. But there was some just some shift, I think, in my agency where I started to realize that I had more control over my life than I thought I had and and that I could do more for me and, and that I had a purpose, right, that I could do something. So I remember I uh, I, I don't think it was long after that, but maybe maybe a few months, maybe a year. I don't know. I went to my high school principal and, and I asked him if I could talk to my peers in high school about my suicide attempts and, you know, my mental health and mental illness and because I felt like nobody was talking about it and. And he was not enthusiastic about yeah. that idea. <laughs> <laughs> that he told me no, and it was a whole thing. And then I wrote a, a an article to the Cape Breton Post. That's awesome. I yeah. liken the high school administration to communist Russia for sti- <laughs> stifling my free speech and all this stuff. But, but that was all because I wanted to, to open up more uh, mm-hmm. about these experiences, right? And... Um, you know, for, for in my side of the story, people hear my side of the story all the time. You know, then I go off and I pursue this and, and, and university and then clinical work and all this stuff. But on your side of the story, uh, you said, I think in your letter or maybe after we eventually met, that you didn't know if I just went back the next day and yeah, know, finished I, it. I, I didn't. Um, I think along the way, like I, I knew your name was Mark. I think we had established that. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know your last name. I didn't know anything. And, um 
at the time, even for social media, things like that. I, there was, Facebook hadn't been invented yet. Yeah, there's, there's no <laughs> way I could have found you. After you no. left in, in the ambulance, that was it. It was I never saw you again. Right. So what did you do after that? Okay, so I, I pack up in the ambulance. I assume you gave a police report? I... I feel like it was, I, I definitely didn't do a report. I feel like it was one of those um, little notepad jobs right. of who are you, what's your name, and that sort of, there, was, there wasn't any you formal so that when I can I, remember. Anyway. When I first tried to find you, one of my first thoughts was, oh, okay, I'll get my police report because it'll say his name. Uh, a, they f- they fought my uh, Freedom of Information. Or actually, no, first I just requested, and they denied. Mm. I put in a Freedom of Information Act request, which they denied again. I appealed their denial <laughs> because I'm a bit persistent. <laughs> <laughs> because the basis of their denial was, we can't disclose records about minors. And I said, aha, I am the minor, and it says in the law, if you actually read it, that you, you can't disclose information about minors unless the minor is requesting their own information. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> when I finally did the appeal, my appeal was granted by the adjudicator or mm-hmm. whoever it is because I was right and I knew that I was right. Uh, I get the records. No mention of you whatsoever anyway. <laughs> I'm actually not even sitting here right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, this is all just a figment yeah. of my imagination. It's like Fight Club. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you are me. Yeah. No. <laughs> Sorry to spoil Fight Club for anybody. Oh. <laughs> um, but but um, I had asked, I remember when I, I don't remember why I got this urge to suddenly look for you. So this is uh, a dozen years later, 12 or 13 years later, I think by this point, I'm I'd been doing media stuff. I'd gone off and finished two degrees. I was in Toronto. I had done the TED Talk already, uh, probably like a year prior to that or something like that, in which I talk about you uh, and the man, the stranger in the light brown jacket who saved my life, right? Uh, and then disappeared into the night, rode off into the sunset, <laughs> never heard from again. Um, and I felt like an imposter, actually, and, and like like I like I just told a story and I didn't even know if it was entirely true because this TED talk was viral all over the place and Mm -hmm. I didn't even know if you were real. I remember reaching out to, uh, well, trying to get the police record and I reached out to uh, Andre Picard, who has been on, uh, he's a health reporter, uh, health columnist rather for the Globe and Mail. Uh, He's been on this show before. Uh, and I said, look, you know, I, I've reached out for the for my police records. I'd pulled my health records. There was no mention of this stranger who saved my life that night. Um, I said, what what's your advice as a as a uh, media personality for how I can go about this? How do I do some investigative journalism or whatever it is to mm-hmm. find out who this person is? And and he said, yeah, that he agreed that the, the police wouldn't be much of a route. And uh, that's when I got the idea to uh, propose to Canada AM. Uh, uh, then Canada's most watched morning show. I'd already done the show four, four or five times, I think, before, mm-hmm. uh, to come on and and ask for the public's help in finding you. It was um, the week of Bell Let's Talk uh, in Canada, and I said that I wanted to find this stranger who saved my life. All I know that is that it was a dozen years ago. It was in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, and he was wearing a light brown jacket. That's all I had. That's all I had, nothing <laughs> yeah. else. And I don't even know if he's real. Um, but he pulled me off a bridge one night. And the producer, I remember, he was just like, yeah, cool, let's do it. <laughs> it was like he was just the most supportive person. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, and I remember going on the air, uh, told some of these stories that we just talked about, uh, the ones from the TED Talk, too. They showed a clip. I went on. By this point, we Facebook had been invented. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I went on my Facebook and Twitter <clears throat> pages, shared uh, some of these stories, and asked for the public's help in finding you. And much to my surprise, uh, I often do things without fully appreciating the consequences in advance. I just kind of do them. If I overthought about the consequences, I'd never do anything big. I don't think I would have accomplished anything in my life. <laughs> I really don't. Because um, within an hour, I start getting messages from people. Um, one from somebody who said he was, I think, your roommate at the time, mm-hmm. and somebody else who identified as your brother-in-law or, or family relation mm-hmm. of some sort. Uh, and, and they suggested that they knew you. Yeah, people had heard the story on my end over the years. So you leave the bridge that so night. I, I left the bridge that night and went to work. And just, and I was, you still went to work? Oh, yeah. I was, I was late. <laughs> Got a job to do. Yeah, I was a little late. But uh, um, so I, I finished my shift. I went home in the morning. And um, at the time, I, uh, myself and two friends were renting a house in Sydney. So um, I told my friends when they got up the next day, like, what had happened the night before. 
Um, How did your friends react to that? Just as you know, kind of as you'd expect, like well, that's crazy. You know, yeah, like, yeah. But um, so it was just kind of this. You know, people that were close to me knew what had happened, um, and I was just like, I, I don't know. People ask like, what had happened? What happened to the kid? What happened to the boy? And right. I, I don't know. I know what happened to that kid. It's a story that I would tell for years after, for more than a decade after. It's a story that, as I've said, was the basis for my own TEDx Toronto talk in 2013, the one that went viral all over the world, getting millions of views in which I talk about this stranger in the light brown jacket who saved my life. Then, later, when I would look for Mike and find him, it would push us both into the spotlight, Mike especially. But at the time, we were both just anonymous people, kids really, just going about our lives when we met on that winter night in Cape Breton. So in the next episode, I asked the question, what brought Mike to the bridge that night? Why was he there at the right place at the right time? I'm Mark Hennick, and you're listening to So-Called Normal. You've been listening to a special episode of So-Called Normal with Mark Hennick. If you like what you heard, share the episode with others. You can always follow Mark on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Instagram at Mark Hennick. Otherwise, you might want to check out his website, markhennick.com. This special series of So-Called Normal has been produced by Mark Hennick and Eye Contact Productions. I'm Dave Trafford.